Hey guys, welcome to this week's show. We are busting the earnings myth. Just because a company makes a big profit does it mean the share price is gonna move up. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, and tune into this broadcast and you'll find out exactly why. See you in the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Bankster, and as always, my faithful outsider companion and co-host, Mitchell Lorenzo. What a way to bust out an intro, Mr. B. Thanks very much for having me on the show. And there's a couple of other things that I'd like to bust today, if you'd mm. be so kind. And that is some myths surrounding earnings. As we know, companies come out, report their quarterly earnings, profit, loss, and there's a few little tricks and, uh, and some tips that we can offer around that. Very much so. I mean, it's probably one of the more volatile times in markets when we see companies go through that earnings cycle, as it's known. And all that glistens isn't always gold. So it's easy to bust a myth. Uh, you think sometimes a company that banks good earnings and makes plenty of money, or well, the share price should be going up, but not necessarily the case. Not the case. And today, as we've done plenty of times in the past, we play Mythbusters, great TV shows. So we watch that all the time with my dad when I was a kid. Which one would you be if you were on there? The guy with the beard and the glasses I liked, yeah. Adam, wasn't it? Is that I right? think so, and the other one was Jamie, right? That's an interesting duo, yeah. Great duo. Mm. And I guess a good place to start, but getting back on topic here, is to talk about, for those who maybe don't know, is what are earnings mm. and how do they differ across, across say, the US and the Aussie market? Because okay. they are very different. Sure. So in Australia, companies report every six months. I'll talk about what reporting is in a moment. In the US, typically, it's every quarter. Sure. A lot more frequent over there. So what exactly are we talking about here? At the end of each quarter, the company will come out and say, okay, this is what our sales have been, this is what our profit has been, potentially this is what our earnings per share, which is EPS, important ratio to look at, earnings per share, has been. And they'll present that to the broader market to give, if you like, a bit of a benchmark or a waypoint to see how the year is going. Um, oftentimes you think about annual performance in a company, that's an awful long time, especially in the current market. So having those quarterly guidance notes from companies where they come out and say, this is what we've done, but more importantly, this is how we see the next 90 days or so playing out. It's very, very important for investors to ensure that their funds are deployed where they feel is the best opportunity for them to get that risk return ratio right. Now, obviously there's very different ways of analyzing and understanding those earnings statements from a trader's versus an investor's point of view. Yeah. Before we talk about each of those differences, can we talk about why they're so important, these earnings? Why do they dictate so much of the market? Well, earnings are interesting, and this is where there's a terrible disconnect. Uh, and we'll talk about companies that have come out with good numbers and seen the price flop. Uh, and you think, well, surely that can't happen. What we've got to recognize is earnings are a reflection of what's happened, and the share price is a reflection of what's expected to happen. So the price of a share today isn't because of what it's done solely, obviously to some extent it's because of what it's done, but it's more a reflection on where the market foresees it going, going forward. Um, so would you say there's a large influence on behavioral finance, which we've chatted about before, because often at times, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it's the expectations of what the earnings are going to be that may drive prices up or down, we get a different result, we can often see the opposite. Again. Yeah, look, there can be a lot of expectation in here and that can be a real red herring for people. So the typical benchmark that people use is the analysts consensus forecast. There's a whole bunch of analysts and their forecast might be, we expect this company to make you know, $2.2 billion in sales for the quarter. Sure. That's the sort of average figure. Some people think four, some people think one, but on consensus, most analysts are in the middle. And there's a reason for that herd mentality, I think, for analysts, because you know, normal distribution uh, means that it's likely to be you know, safer to play there rather than go on the extremes. To give an example of what I mean by extremes, off topic for a moment, sure. there was one analyst, only one analyst on Wall Street that called Enron as being um, you know, a bogus company with false earnings, only one, right up on the extreme of the normal, normal distribution. Everyone else was, no, oh, it's a great business, it's earnings growth, da 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 And that, uh, that analyst actually got fired by the bank they worked for because they were losing out on corporate deals from Enron at the time because they were calling the stock as a short and it been, you know, the valuation wasn't correct. So it's interesting, it's very rare that you get analysts totally go on a limb. Most of the time they stay somewhere in the middle. So that consensus forecast is very average. And then what you'll look at is what the company actually announces versus what the market's expectation was. And we've seen this happen a few times. And I know we can talk about the difference between a trader and investor over mm -hmm. earnings period of time. Mm -hmm. Facebook's just, just, just announced earnings recently on the yeah. 27th, for example. Now to put that into perspective for our listeners here, the, how, what was the, the consensus of their earnings per share mm -hmm. and what actually came out was 20% higher. That's right. They're beating yeah. expectations by 20%, mm -hmm. which is a great result, right? 
You would think so, yeah. But the shares fell 3% on that day. That's right. So <laughs> so you'd be very forgiven. So let's take a step out of this. If you're an investor, you just look at earnings as just a blip in the annual calendar of what goes on with the share price. You write it out, taking the longer term view. As someone that's a trader, those sort of pullbacks or opportunities to maybe get in at those lower levels is a very, very different mindset. It's like you know, going for food. You can say, we're going for food, but it means a lot of different things to all different people. You go for fast food, you go for you know, a la carte, um, you know, Michelin star stuff, you go for takeaway, eat in, um, you know, keto, uh, vegan, or whatever it may it's be. Going on, yeah. So it's not just food, there's a lot of subsets. So an investor is just going to buy, hold, let the thing run along, hopefully it goes up over time. Uh, the trader is going to look at that and go, okay, there's some volatility around earnings. How can I capitalize on that? Maybe we'll touch on a few strategies for that later on. Um, so. Analysts set up the stand, market consensus was here. Facebook came out with earnings per share 20% higher than what analysts expected. And as you say, the share price dropped. And you think, well, how can that really be? It makes no, no mm -hmm. sense whatsoever. And, and, and great result as it was for Facebook. And, and, and you've got to remember, they come out of a very, very strong quarter after a very strong year where everything being online, people are spending more time on the platform, advertisers are spending more and more on the platform. So revenues are looking pretty fat. But the look forward where the share price actually is right now is a reflection of future earnings expectations. So even though the share price uh, dropped and the earnings exceeded expectations, what that would suggest is everyone in the market was expecting a very, very strong number already. And maybe that was already factored into the price of the shares. Which is a concept on its own, right? Mm -hmm. Called the random walk. Okay, so we'll maybe talk about the random walk in, in a sure. wee while. So, out come the earnings, they're better than expectation, but the share price has dropped. And the reason for that is that Facebook, as a business going a little bit deeper into it, is going to be facing a pretty big challenge over the coming months. And Facebook on its own won't just be facing this challenge, but a lot of the companies that advertise through Facebook for business on there will be too. And that is the new Apple um, upgrade, which includes a block, if you will, for being able to target and track people and their activity on third party sites. So that means if you're trying to advertise to a certain subset of people in a particular location, it's almost impossible now if they turn that setting off. It's getting much, much harder to do that. Okay. okay. Now, I mean, this has happened before, if you recall with the Cambridge Analytica stuff after the Trump win in the previous election, um, you know, that was all diluted down your ability to be very niche and target people. And this is the next phase of that, I suppose. And yeah, this is going to wreak havoc for a lot of advertisers. Let's just say um, you're a wedding photographer in a particular location. Being able to target people that are getting married in your area is your bread and butter to Facebook advertising. So, you know, if someone's looking at you know, wedding venues in your area, well, that's probably going to result in a pop up ad on Facebook. And everyone's seen those kind of things. And it's quite annoying sometimes when it comes onto your feed. You almost feel like Big Brother's watching it, <laughs> including air material, which obviously comes up there too. Um, now you're not going to have that facility, which is going to pose the question okay, so if you're going to advertise, do you still want to use the Facebook platform to do that? And maybe that drop in share price is the realization, there's only a 3% drop, um, but you know, it's a realization that maybe you know, advertising revenue may slow down a little bit in the next quarter, and hence that's the reaction of the share price. So there's a little bit of a sort of insight, a snippet, if you will, into what's going on there. It's certainly a really good fundamental information, period of information. Is, as a conspiracy theorist, is this part of Apple's grand plan to maybe create their own sort of marketing strategy behind this? Who knows? I mean, from an Apple perspective, it's nice to say, look, we look after our users by making sure you're not bombarded with stuff, which everyone probably wants. Good for their reputation. But if you also own the key to that vault and say, but well, we can't turn on that data mapping for our own purposes, that'd be pretty smart. You can only imagine someone at Cupertino has probably come up with that <laughs> as, a, as a business plan somewhere on the line. So, you know, turning back to Facebook as a trader, that 3% pullback. Uh, in share price, as a trader, I see as a buying opportunity. It's not something to be fearful of. It's time to fill up the boots with more of that stock. That's and something. That, that, so that's something that we do with Andrew Gibbs, who's very great to have on our team. RSI four, where we mm. pick performing stocks like Facebook, for example, pick them up on the pullback and yeah. overlay a bullish option strategy to take profit on the upside. It, it, it's kind of like going to the shop. You want to buy a pair of sneakers, and you're just getting them for five percent off today. It's great the same pair of sneakers, but it's slightly cheaper. Uh, and that's the mindset that a trader would have versus an investor that's just happy to to sort of roll through that. Uh, and look, I mean, the key thing from a fundamentals perspective, and we've talked about this in previous podcasts, is that litmus test. 
Do you see the business that you're investing in to be a bigger or smaller part of the future, or at least the time frame you're looking to trade? You know, I think everyone knows that the, you know, the big four in the technology space, um, you know, the FANG stocks, Facebook being one, um, are more than likely to be a continued bigger part of their future rather than a smaller part. So the long-term fundamentals continue to remain robust. Absolutely. Just a buying opportunity. Great piece of information. Mm -hmm. And let's dial this back now to a little bit more of a local example. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Temple and Webster. Mm -hmm. TBW is the code there for those who don't know. And we saw sales in their most recent report up higher from the previous report by 120 percent mm. that's a massive growth in revenue when you're so selling that much yet their shares were down four percent on the day yeah it makes no sense that's another one that you know, just leaves most people flummoxed as to how can that be <laughs> um, and that's a very good thing to get flummoxed on because there's no logic to it and again that's why that understanding of markets being able to lift the bonnet and dive deep into this stuff and truly understand what's going on in there is the key so yeah Temple Webster brilliant number and it's been along the lines with Harvey Norman, JB Hi-Fi, Temple Webster there's been so much money that's been spent online which has been their niche particularly um, which is which has been a boom for the business um, yeah, its profile is raised, it's one of those companies that's being talked about now versus one that most people probably hadn't heard of, say, six or nine months ago. Sure. The question is, is that growth pattern sustainable? And that is the challenge for businesses like Temple and Webster. Now, for what it's worth, you know, just because we've clocked over to 2021, things haven't really changed that much. It's just a different year on the calendar, but the circumstances that we had at the back end of last year are still here now. People are still shopping online. People still can't go overseas. People are still spending more time in their home. And as a consequence, that online spending, particularly in a, a store with this furniture and, and things for your house, is, is a hot button for people right now. I guess the question for anyone that's an investor or a trader is, do you expect that to continue to be the case? Maybe post-vaccination when people start getting out and about and it's safe to do so. Um, yeah, what does that then look like for the business? So it's a really smart business. I had the pleasure um, a few months ago talking to one of the directors and, uh, and yeah, it's really good to just sort of see the scale and quantum of the growth there. And what they're now faced with is, okay, where can we add, not just have more sales, but add more margin to what we do, like own grown products. And this is not just some of the supermarkets, you know, you think Woolies and Coles, um, do you sell Heinz beans or do you sell Woolworths own brand? And not just Woolworths own brand, but is it Woolworths Select or is it, you know, budget basic value and so on and so forth. So you're probably going to see Templin Webster explore that more where they start to push their own brand through their thickening up their margin. So if there is a slowdown in sales, that extra profit margin in own label type products offsets that slowdown in sales and keeps the revenue line up. Um, they've certainly set the world right and there's a lot of expectation on where that can go. And if management continue to be as proactive and smart as they've been over the last couple of years, I suspect that you're going to see more own-grown labor in there and, and as a consequence, margins fat now. And if there is a slowdown in sales, that will go a long way towards compensating for it. It's, an inter it's interesting that you make some of those points because you can almost view these stocks like Temple and Webster, Harvey Norman, JB Hi-Fi mm -hmm. as almost cyclical stocks. You know, when you say cyclical stocks as an investor, you think energy, banking, resources because, yeah. or energy and banking more so because they will fluctuate with the economy. Everyone's getting stimulus checks, everyone's got more money in their pocket and yeah. they're choosing to spend it on these kinds of stocks. Mm -hmm. As an investor or even as a trader, what would you personally be looking for as an investment into a company when their growth has been so stretched recently? I think management attitude. You know, if you've got management that are sitting back and kicking their heels and going, oh, look, we cracked it, that's bad news. And, and let's face it, there's very, very few CEOs and management teams that like that. Um, you know, if you listen to Jerry Harvey, for example, they're spending more now on printed advertising than ever before. So even though sales are very strong, they're putting a lot of that back into their marketing to continue that machine up. You know, you buy a newspaper if you're one of the few people that still do that, um, <laughs> then guarantee you're going to find a Harvey Norman supplement that's in there with all their stuff. So they're continuing to foster and fuel that fire of demand. And I think Tampa West, the good management team there, as I say, that move into margin fattening products. Uh, it's really, really smart. And they're the kind of things to look for. If you rest on your laurels, that's where things start to uh, to go wrong. That said, you know, you, you, you know, if you take the other side of the coin, talk about old world stocks, take British Petroleum, BP, you know, magnificent business, uh, did great things under its uh, former CEO, John Brown. Uh, the new CEO has been in the city for, for about a year uh, and they just come out with really bad numbers, partly because obviously oil prices uh, have been affected by the lack of travel uh, and it's put massive pressure on the business. It's had its, I think it had its worst quarter since the um, uh, the Horizon platform exploded and blew up in the Gulf of Mexico in terms of write-offs and downgrades of its business. But even their management aren't sitting back and going, okay, so oil prices are low, we've got to wait for them to improve. They're also divesting with the goal to invest in renewable energies 
So the management being proactive there too. You've got to have proactive management in a business, definitely. That's a key to its success. And I think that's why, you know, if we look at the other side of the coin, companies like AMP have struggled because they've had poor quality management that have been uh, at this crossroads of trying to change the business but not really fully committed to that. You know, is it an advice-based platform? Is it a delivery platform? Is it somewhere in the middle? And so you've got to have good management that are prepared to try new things. Um, you know, Virgin is another example of that where um, despite, you know, a, a terrific run out of the business, uh, and, and having good brand loyalty, it wasn't making any money. And by appointing a former Jetstar CEO in, in, in uh, replacement, I think for Paul B uh, Borghetti, um, the, the, the incumbent, the former Jetstar uh, CEO has been used to running a budget airline, which is ultimately what, uh, what Virgin will have to be to survive in the current marketplace. You can't say, oh, this is what we do. If it doesn't make money, you've got to be able to turn a coin. Gotcha. So looking for good management like that is, it, it, it is really, really important. So it's not just the earnings, uh, but it's where the share price market reacts to that, whether it's still a buying opportunity for further growth and the further growth will only come from good management that provide very, very clear direction and logical direction. Now, BP, fossil fuels, moving into renewables to become a net zero type business by, I don't know, 2050. It's one of the world's largest oil producers now. That, that, that's a big quantum shift. So you have good management to do that. And that's where the growth comes from. Absolutely. And as advisors, that stewardship yeah. of companies is something that we yeah. vigorously include in our research. Absolutely. And look, let's face it, as we often say, you know, talk's cheap, but money buys the whiskey. You can flap your gums and say, oh, we're going to do this, but what does the plan look like? And is it being delivered on? That's the other thing to look for. All right. We'll throw, to throw a, a final curveball at you mm -hmm. here, Amy, one more example that I want to share here yeah. with our listeners. Shopify, code okay. there is S-H-O-P, shop. You sure? Shop. I believe so. <laughs> I think so. Makes sense. Now, they beat their earnings expectations by a whopping 50%. Facebook was doing it, it was It was nearly 60%. This right. is their last earnings, which was, was October. The 29th of October was their last. Okay. So not, not, not as recent, but a good example nonetheless. Yeah. Facebook, 20% on EPS. That's great. 50% mm -hmm. is a very big beating of those expectations, yet yeah. their share price plummeted. <laughs> it's since up 20, 30%. That's right. So again, let's go back to that trader mindset. Let's just think about that. Shopify, brilliant business. For those people that don't know the fundamentals of Shopify, if you have an online shop, these are the people that provide you with the plain vanilla carcass that you can run, <laughs> customize it and run your own online business without having to build all the e-commerce dramas that you need with it. Fantastic business, litmus test, very suited to online e-commerce, which as we know is a bigger part of what's going on. It's also done for you, monthly subscription, phenomenal business. The margins on its product were actually quite thin. I think they did something like, a, was it a couple hundred, no, two, two billion in sales and 200 million in profit. That's exactly so right. So the margins are uh, pretty thin on that type of product. But it's a product where you can imagine there's gonna be much more revenue as more and more people are Move pushing the continually into the online space. Makes and, sense. And need that e-commerce platform that's robust, Payment gateway in play, delivery gateway in play, reporting, you know, it's, it's secure site, all the things that you want to show sure. in that space. So that's a nutshell, in a nutshell what they do. So yeah, you're right. They came up with earnings that were almost 60% up above expectations and the share price falls away. Great buying opportunity. Absolutely. And over the last two months, we've seen it put on a further 30% over I think it's about 1250 bucks a share right now, roughly around there, which is you know, phenomenal. A bit expensive for a covered call. I get about a pack of 100 of those, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, some people can do that. So they're coming up with their earnings again in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, February 17th. February 17th. So there's one to look out for. And, and again, you might get really, really strong guidance and a pullback. Does that present a buying opportunity? Um, and, and this is the juxtaposition as investors and traders that we all face. Now, as a trader, and this is why I far prefer being a trader uh, than an investor. If you're an investor, you're either going to buy or not buy the shares, or if you own them, sell them. So buy, sell, or nothing. They're your three options. Whereas as a trader, particularly with the skill set that we have in the derivative space, with the option space, um, you know, we can set up traps for if it moves up, if it moves down, if it stays sideways, if it has a massive pop up or a massive pop down, so that we've got trades set to bit of profit from there. And that's the advantage of upskilling and learning how this game actually works rather than, oh, they made a big profit, their share price must be going up. Actually, no, it doesn't always work that way as we've explored. So you've got to have a, a little bit more of an array of weaponry in the kit bag right now to get a profit from these current markets. And you know, if we are at the start, there's a big call coming up, if we're at the start of a three year bull market cycle, which some commentators out there are talking about us being at right now, this isn't the end, this is the start, um, then you've got to have those entry mechanisms in play. And buying on pullbacks is one such way of doing it. And it's a phenomenal way of just getting that extra value add on your business. But if you're an investor and you buy and it keeps going up, 
happy days for you guys too, but you need to be in the right kind of stocks, not holding those old school businesses that have just continued to drift down and struggle, but recalibrate your portfolio to be in not just tech, but companies to an extent that are forward looking and making the most of the opportunity in the landscape that we see today. And that my friend is what we call the litmus test. And that's more important than any ratio, PE, earnings per share or anything else. It's the litmus test of saying, this business has got legs and motive, uh, momentum because it fulfills a service that's needed in the current and future economy. Well, there you go. You heard it here first, AB. Thanks very much for sharing that. And just to cap off the broadcast, I want to leave our listeners and viewers here with a little bit more of an intrigue. You talked about having more clubs in your golf bag to be able to trade these kinds of things yep. like earnings. One of the strategies that we've taught our advanced options traders, for example, is a straddle. Yes. Can we leave our viewers on a little bit of a, an intrigue as to what the straddle is and how it works and why it's so effective? Okay, so with the straddle, you're not looking, you're not saying the price is going to move up or down, you just know it's going to move one way or the other. So an earnings announcement is typically a very, very good time to use that strategy. Now, I hate to use gambling terms, but it's almost like, a, it's, 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 for, for a better term, it's almost like a bet each way. If it goes up, you're going to make money. If it goes down a lot, you're going to make money. That's how the strategy works in a nutshell. And we use a combination of options to do that. Um, yeah, the returns on it can be pretty aggressive. And the good thing about it, you don't need to put a lot of money up front in order to uh, get a profit from it because you're using leverage in a very safe and contained way. Magnificent strategy. You know, I get emails regularly from, from our clients that are using that. I think 95% was one of the trades last week on a bad overnight profit. It was. And, uh, and you don't need to put your whole account on that. You can put a small amount on it and just snowball that and let that small amount of capital grow into a bigger amount to get your buy and hold stocks like Apple, if that's what, or Facebook, if that's sort of buy and hold stocks that you want to put in there, or Temple and Webster, as we've spoken of earlier. And that's one about that. Stratos was the trader of the year, Michael Petrino, 2019, mm -hmm. what, he, what he used to, yep. to build his account up. So and far. I'm seeing regular investment or income clients that are running you know, a big body of cash on the main cover calls, but they're topping up and getting that supercharge using Stratos. So it pays to know what you're doing. Best investment you've ever made in yourself. Sure. Well, let's leave it there, AB. Thank you very much for your advice. A lot to cover through there and some interesting stats nonetheless. So thank you very much for sharing. Anytime. Pleasure. Well, there you have it, guys. That is the myth of earnings busted. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and of course, hit the notification button in the corner to keep abreast of what we're up to.